Mother Russia Bleeds is a side-scrolling beat-em-up that was released by Le Cartel in 2016. It takes place in an alternate timeline of Russia in 1986 and follows the story of four Romani caught up in a tumultuous time in the country's history. While trying to find the truth behind a secret experiment that has left them addicted to a dangerous, newly created drug called Necro, they get swept up in a revolution that aims to overthrow the country's corrupt, oppressive government. As the story evolves, the heroes begin to find that the corruption of the Russian government has led to them making some shady deals, resulting in some dark secrets, making the goals of the revolution and their own goals one and the same. Let's go through the events of Mother Russia Bleeds and see how linked everything in the story really is. Life for those living in 1980s Russia and Mother Russia Bleeds is quite luxurious. Inside the halls of the tall skyscrapers that dot the cityscape are many signs of prosperity and wealth. There are lavish ornaments generously decorating the walls, piles of money all over the gambling tables, and even gold-plated vaults that can only hold treasure more valuable than the material it's made out of. The people that fill these halls live a life of extravagance and comfort. They trade stories and smoke cigars with their friends in little parlors, listen to live music performed by the world's greatest musicians, and play games to wind down and relax. It's an extremely satisfying and enriching lifestyle that really enables these people to live their best lives. However, there's a problem with it. This isn't the life that most of the Russian populace lives. Those that are lucky enough to live this lifestyle are part of an elite group in Russian society, like government officials and entrepreneurs, that have consolidated most of the wealth of the country towards the top and kept it for themselves. That leaves meager scraps for the rest of the population. And in fact, most of them live in extreme poverty, crammed into ghettos where they struggle to get even their most basic needs met. As they huddle in ramshackle huts, pieced together with the leftover scraps they find in the muck, a lot of these citizens are forced to do what needs to be done in order to survive. Even going so far as to turn to crime to make ends meet. Others feel the struggle of life in the ghetto to be too much to deal with, so they turn to drugs to numb away the misery of their existence, just so they can get through the day. Of course, both of these have a negative social stigma about them, meaning anyone that even gets an opportunity to rise up out of the squalor of the slums will be tainted by the things they had to do to survive there, making it incredibly unlikely that they'll even be given a chance to escape, much less actually do so. And it's this life of endless destitution, desperation, and danger that the heroes of Mother Russia Bleeds have been forced to live for their entire lives. Luckily, each of them, the hot-headed Sergei, the fearsome Ivan, the deranged Boris, and the arrogant Natasha, are exceptional fighters thanks to the training that their father figure, Mikhail, has put them through from an early age. And by participating in fights organized by Mikhail, the group is able to make a living. While waiting for the group to arrive for one of these fights on February 16th, 1986, Mikhail talks to Vlad, a man who is determined to do something about the state of Russian society. Vlad believes that the inequalities between the classes in the country are actually perpetuated by the Bratva, a criminal organization that has managed to infiltrate the government by coercing or blackmailing politicians 
into working for them. By using this corrupt government to work for their interests, the Bratva have been able to elevate themselves out of the slums of the country and into the comfortable penthouses of the elite. But it goes even further. They're also the ones responsible for the hoarding of wealth that is done in the upper echelons of society, which is done so that they are able to stay at the top of the system at the cost of everyone else. Vlad also believes that the Bratva's pursuit of lining their own pockets, no matter the cost, will eventually lead to the destruction of Russia, and is hoping to organize a revolution to stop the organization, root out the corruption of the government, and save the country. However, such a plan requires cooperation amongst the populace, and Vlad is frustrated with Mikhail because he believes Mikhail's fights just push people apart instead of bringing them together, thereby maintaining the status quo and forever keeping them at the mercy of the Bratva and the government. Mikhail, however, doesn't believe in Vlad's conspiracy theories and is just working to bring in some money to make ends meet. Angry at Mikhail's insistence to keep holding the fights, Vlad, after warning that the Bratva will be coming for them next, storms off, refusing to watch a wedge be driven through the community. With the revolutionary finally gone, Mikhail pushes the heroes into the center of the ring, and a huge brawl commences. Despite the number of foes they face, the heroes are able to come out as victors, much to Mikhail's delight. But just as they're about to collect their winnings, large trucks pull up to the edge of the ring, and riot police hop out and surround the group. It seems like Vlad's warning was right. The government, or perhaps more appropriately, the Bratva have come for them. While Mikhail is pulled out of the ring to have a chat with the soldiers, the heroes are beaten and subdued by the security forces. The unconscious heroes are taken to a deep, dark lab, where they are regularly visited by researchers in jumpsuits who inject them with an unknown substance. This continues for a number of weeks, until early one morning, on March 21st, 1986, the heroes wake up, gripping their heads in pain. They pick up the syringes left by their bodies and break out of their cell where they meet one of the researchers. As they try to understand what's happened to them, the researcher lets out that they are suffering from withdrawal and need their injection, but won't explain any more than that as they aren't authorized to. He begins to move in to subdue the heroes, but they've picked up on his hint and inject themselves with the substance in their syringes, which helps restore some of their vitality, whereupon they begin to fight their way out of the lab. As they make their way down the hall, they pass a stack of boxes that have a label upon them that reads, Necro. Remembering that the same kind of boxes were in their cell, the heroes conclude that this must be the substance that they've been injected with. As they move away from the supply of Necro in the lab, the heroes are forced to find other means to fill their syringes, and they find their solution in an unlikely place. They come across a body convulsing on the ground, and notice that some of its blood is laced with Necro. Doing what they need to in order to survive, they siphon up some of the blood in order to just get another dose of Necro, which, they find out, can do more than just heal their injuries. As they move into the next chamber, they encounter lab security forces, and again inject themselves with the Necro, but this time, it greatly enhances their strength, and they easily tear through the security forces to continue their escape. As they move deeper into the lab, they pass by rooms where 
other experiments with Necro were taking place, like one involving a large bear being injected with the drug. A particularly troubling one seems to show the progression of the effects of continued use of the drug. In the first chamber, a prisoner stands relatively unchanged by the experiments, likely because they've received no necro as of yet. But in the next, a subject receiving injections of necro has lost their teeth and hair and twitches in the restraints of the chair, indicating physical and likely behavioral changes begin to manifest as the drug is used. The subjects within the last chamber have become less like people and more like monsters, as their faces and heads are completely warped. One of the creatures convulses uncontrollably, while the other consumes the flesh of a dead one whose blood covers the window of the chamber. This terrifying display shows the dangers of long-term use of Necro, a future the heroes are doomed to suffer if they don't stop using the drug. However, despite seeing what awaits them if they keep using it, the heroes can't help but to continue to use Necro. Not only because they are depending on its effects to make their escape, but also because they can't help themselves. Addiction has already sunk its hooks into them, and the heroes are compelled to keep using it. And while they haven't experienced any of these devastating effects as of yet, at one point in their escape, a pain washes over their head, and they hallucinate a large, gory mass pulsing behind them, indicating they are feeling some sort of effect from the Necro. The heroes escape from the lab and come upon a sewer system where they find the waste of the Necro experiments, including the subjects, are dumped. They easily fight their way through the shambling creatures that live down here. But as they approach the exit of the sewers, they are beset upon by a large, freakish monster. As they fight for their lives, they notice that the monster will periodically stop and inject itself with Necro, indicating that it, just like the other creatures that make up the sewers, is a victim of the mutating properties of the drug. Despite the power the Necro gives the monster, the heroes are able to kill it and make their way out of the sewers. Climbing a ladder to the surface, they find that they're actually in a prison and due to interrupting some prisoners attempting to take advantage of another one, the heroes are forced to fight through inmates, then prison guards, when they cause a full-scale prison riot to occur. Just as they reach the exit, they have another hallucination of the pulsing bloody mass. But this time, they see a small, spiny beast on the ground as well. The vision fades, and the group makes their way outside, where they meet the prison's warden. Confident that he'll be able to stop them, the warden divulges some information about the lab beneath the prison, namely that he knew of it, confirming that the government is involved in the necro experiments since the prison is a state-run facility. But exactly why remains a mystery. The Warden then begins to fire upon the heroes, but they are able to easily overwhelm him with gunfire of their own and make their escape from the prison. They return to the slums to find it even worse than they remember. Buildings are even more dilapidated and run down, and drug addicts are everywhere. The group talks to one of their old friends, who explains that after they got abducted, a gang of skinheads took over and started passing out Necro, implying a possible connection to the government. The man explains that the only person that has bothered trying to stand up to the dealers is Vlad, who is still trying to start a revolution, and that if they want to help him, they should go meet him at the train station on the other side of the camp. 
just before they set out, the heroes have another hallucination. This time, seeing that the small beast has apparently hatched from its previous form and grown. After the vision fades, the heroes move through the slums, coming across one of the Bratva's henchmen, thanking the skinheads for their work in taking over the area, then telling them to be on the lookout for the heroes and to bring them to the Bratva if they're found. The heroes find this conversation significant, because not only does it indicate that the Bratva and the skinheads are working together, but since the skinheads are handing out Necro, which is being produced in a government lab, it implies that Vlad's theory that the Bratva has its hands in the government isn't so crazy after all. Due to this order from the Bratva, the heroes are forced to fight their way through their former home, which doesn't bother them too much since it means they are able to help liberate it from the skinheads. They eventually come face to face with the gang's leader and learn that the skinheads were able to easily take over the camp following the government raid because the operation carted nearly everyone off, although the skinheads themselves weren't involved with the actual raid. They're obviously involved with the government now, though, since they're being given necro to distribute to the populace in the slums, and the leader reveals just where they're getting their necro from. A middleman named Mikhail. The same Mikhail that had raised the heroes from childhood. To learn that Mikhail, their father figure, and the de facto leader of the camp, betrayed their home and community, and sold out to the government, comes as a shock to the heroes, who determine they'll have to find Mikhail at some point to get the truth out of him. But before they can do that, they have to meet Vlad. So they kill the leader of the skinheads and make their way to the train station. They meet Vlad there when they arrive a few hours later, and he and the heroes catch up a bit. Vlad explains what happened in the camp after they were abducted about a month ago, and the heroes tell him about the secret lab they were imprisoned in. Vlad then tells the heroes that the only way for everything to have happened the way it did, the abduction, the skinheads, the necro, is if the Bratva and the government were working together, just like he thought, and the Bratva are so concerned with having all of the money in the country that they're willing to sacrifice the country just to get it. He argues that the only way to save the country and ultimately, themselves, is to start the revolution. And luckily, the story of the heroes escape from prison has spread across the land and finally inspired the masses to join in his cause. He plans to head to the capital for a protest that he hopes will escalate past that to a full-blown revolution. And since they have the same enemies, asks the heroes for their help. They agree to go along, but refuse to commit to helping the revolution, as they're not interested in overthrowing the government, only in getting revenge on those that tortured them for a month. With everything agreed, they get ready to head out, but are then interrupted by some government agents who try to stop their plans before they can actually start. The heroes make quick work of the goons, which greatly impresses Vlad, and he again asks the heroes to join the revolution. But the heroes maintain that they're only interested in revenge, so reject the offer. Everyone hops on the train, and the heroes stop some hooligans from harassing some passengers, which causes the train inspectors to get involved, and escalates the conflict to the point of the heroes having to do a full-blown takeover of the entire train. While battling on the train, the heroes have another hallucination where they see this spiny creature has evolved into what looks like a human skeleton roughly the age of a teenager. But just as suddenly as it appears, 
the vision fades. Knowing the government will pull out all the stops and likely send the army to stop them, Vlad stops the train a few miles outside of the city to prevent the protest from walking right into their trap, and thus stopping the revolution before it can begin. It's at this point that the heroes take their leave of him and his people. But before they do, Vlad tells them of a private club downtown that's owned by the Bratva that would be a good place for them to find some information. Also warning that the parties in there can get really freaky. He also tells them to meet him in the town square when they're done, if they have a change of heart and would like to help the revolution. With that, the heroes head into the city, determined to not only get revenge on the Bratva, but also on the man that betrayed them. The heroes find the nightclub that Vlad was talking about, and upon finding it's a BDSM club, understand why Vlad said it could get freaky in there. As they move through a dungeon deep in the club, the heroes have another hallucination, where the walls turn into a gory mass, and unlike the previous ones, ghostly apparitions of themselves manifest and attack them. Although they're able to fight off the specters, obviously, the hallucinations are getting stronger, which can only be bad for them. The heroes continue on through, eventually reaching the deepest room of the club, where they find Mikhail scrubbing the floor clean from a recent session. The heroes obviously lay into him, but Mikhail stops them before they can attack and promises to explain everything. However, before he does, the lights of the room flash off and on. And as they do so, more and more gimps appear next to Mikhail. Eventually, a large mountain of a man bursts through the glass from a neighboring room and, using the tools of his brutal trade, attempts to impale, beat, and slash the heroes. But, his moves are way too slow to hit them, and they're able to dodge his attacks and overcome him, killing him there in his sex dungeon. Unfortunately, Mikhail was able to slip away in the chaos of the attack, meaning the only lead the heroes had is now gone. So they decide to meet Vlad at the town square, hoping he will be able to help them track down Mikhail. On the way there, however, they find the streets are a war zone. There's fires consuming destroyed barricades, cars flipped over and vandalized, and security forces literally attacking anyone they find in the streets. They fight their way through some security forces until a child that was sent by Vlad to find them leads them to the main plaza. Here, Vlad explains that while they were protesting, the army came down on them much harder than they expected them to, to the point of losing control. They shot into the crowd, killing dozens of civilians, and those that were lucky enough to dodge the bullets were attacked and beaten within an inch of their life. It was a massacre. But it was also the spark needed to finally get the public to rise up and start the revolution. Ever since, the people have been trying to storm the headquarters of the government to make sure that those responsible for the slaughter of the civilians pay for their crime. And Vlad is here to help them do so, as it's going to help with his goal of overthrowing the government and putting an end to its transgressions. However, the security forces have them heavily outnumbered and outgunned, and they're gathering their forces at the end of the plaza for one final march through the city to eradicate the revolutionaries. Vlad asks for the hero's assistance one last time, saying if they don't help, then not only will the revolution die before it can finish what it started, 
but hundreds of people will be slaughtered by the soldiers. Recognizing that helping Vlad will get them closer to getting revenge, the heroes agree to help the revolution. And despite suffering from one of their hallucinations in the middle of the battle, where they see the skeletal creature now lounging on the pulsing mask, they beat back the gathered security forces and their large war machine, opening up the path to the government headquarters. They sneak through a garage and come upon Mikhail, who is alive, although worse for wear. He tells the heroes that what they've done since coming to the city has upset the Bratva, to put it mildly, and he gave up his arm to convince them to spare the heroes, showing that he still does care for them, despite siding with their enemy. He begs them to turn back, to return to the camp and lie low so that they can get out of this alive. But the heroes, still focused on getting revenge, reject Mikhail's plea and head deeper into the building. They are eventually locked within an arena where the Bratva, happy to finally have these pests right where they want them, force the heroes to undergo gladiatorial battles for their entertainment. First, they release dozens of their henchmen, armed to the teeth to kill the heroes. It isn't long before they're beaten back, so the Bratva send out a ton of necromutants to overwhelm them, and again, their creatures are defeated. Although highly entertained by this point, the Bratva are finally ready to bring the event to its end and see these nuisances get their just desserts. So they release the main attraction, Masha, the bear that the group had seen in the lab being injected with necro into the arena to rip the heroes apart. But when the group is able to overcome the odds and defeat the monstrosity, the Bratva are shocked into silence, and they quickly retreat behind their shutters. Mikhail walks in, and upon seeing the piles of bodies at the feet of the heroes, and hearing their fierce contempt for him, he realizes that something has changed within his former friends. Something has taken away what made them human. The heroes force him to lead them on, and he takes them to an elevator where suddenly they're overcome by one of their hallucinations. They're able to quickly shake it off, but when they come back to reality, they see Mikhail shaking, pointing a gun at them. He was already unsettled from seeing their work in the arena and their lack of empathy about the whole thing. So seeing them get taken over by Necro's influence an inch closer to insanity causes him to snap. Although he's managed to hide it thus far, Mikhail is terrified of the Bratva and what they will do to them if they catch them alive. And ultimately, it's too much for him. Despite his friends trying to comfort him, Mikhail turns the gun to his head and kills himself. Although they had come here in part to get revenge on Mikhail, seeing him dead fills the heroes with sorrow. They apologize to their mentor, then make their way into the government headquarters. It's early in the morning on March 23rd when they storm through the halls of the building. The only hiccup they experience on the way doesn't come from the guards that oppose them, but from their own mind. Partway through, they have to fight through a strong hallucination, where they have to escape from a sliding, fleshy wall that threatens to consume them. Something that implies that the time will soon come where they can't run from their addiction anymore and will have to face it. That time isn't now though, and after shaking off the hallucination, they continue on until they find the leader of the government in its office. Under threat of violence, the group gets the politician to admit that the government and the Bratva are working together 
and that they funded the Bratva's experiments with Necro and their abductions. But he then argues that he was forced to go along with them due to the stranglehold that the Bratva has over him and his colleagues, and that means the hero should let him go. However, the silver tongue of the politician doesn't sway the heroes, as Vlad has done a good job teaching them that the only reason the Bratva have as much free reign to take advantage of the country as they do is because the government protects them. So the heroes decide the best thing to do is cut the head off the snake. That sends the leader cowering under his desk, whereupon guards come in and attack the heroes. But they're not trying to defeat them. They're trying to distract them. The hope is that the government leader can use the chaos of the fight to sneak out from under his desk and climb onto a rope ladder dropped from a helicopter and flee. But the heroes see right through the plan and prevent the politician's escape. He puts his hands up and tries to negotiate with the heroes. But before negotiations can begin, the heroes get a splitting headache and the room fades to their familiar hallucination. However, this time, things are different. The skeletal creature sitting upon the pulsing mass actually speaks to the heroes and compels them to take more and more necro. As the words reach their ears, the heroes realize that the creature and its entire evolution has been a metaphor for their dependence on Necro. As they fell deeper and deeper into their addiction, the beast, the creature, grew more and more powerful. Now, it almost has full control over them. They also realize that the only way they'll ever be able to stop these visions and prevent Necro's takeover is to stop taking the drug and overcome their addiction. And they choose here and now to do so. It's not as easy as it seems, however, as the heroes find that their addiction fights back, creating fleshy walls with jaws and spikes that close in on them and spawning ghostly apparitions of themselves that stab them with needles. And most frightening of all, these manifestations are able to actually cause physical harm to them, putting the heroes in a fight for their lives. Using the needles they're attacked with, the heroes are able to push back the fleshy walls and end the assault. But their fight's not over yet. Fists come raining down from the ceiling, threatening to crush them where they stand. And needle-like creatures emerge from the void to jump on them and suck their life away. Again, the heroes are able to overcome the challenge, showing they're gaining the upper hand on Necro's influence, something that angers the skeletal entity. It decides to take matters into its own hands and jumps from the pulsing mass to face the group itself. It's a formidable foe, with an ability to throw out quick, devastating punches, launch a large tendril from its arm to attack from across the room, slam into the ground with the force that upends those standing upon it, and release a wave of energy and needles that threatens to poison anyone stabbed with one of the instruments. This last attack leaves the entity fatigued though, and while it takes a moment to recuperate, it leaves it open to attack. The heroes use this small window to retaliate against the entity, eventually doing enough damage that pushes the entity to the brink. It undergoes a transformation, duplicates itself, and restarts its assault with renewed vigor. But despite its enhanced power and strength, despite doubling its damage potential, the entity is unable to overcome the resolve of the heroes and is eventually defeated in combat. However, 
Just because it lost the battle, doesn't mean it lost the war. The vision fades, and the heroes find that while they were battling the entity in their mind, they had also been fighting for their lives in the real world, resulting in a bloodbath that even claimed the life of the government leader. But the dual fights were harrowing, and if the heroes had used a necro at any point to get through them, whether it was to heal or boost their strength, then they find the damage of the fights has left an unusual toll on them. Vlad walks in, surprised to see they're alive, but when they double over in pain and vomit blood, he realizes that they've still been taking Necro, and it's finally reached the point where there's no coming back. Although they defeated the manifestation of Necro in combat and overcame their dependence on the drug, by continuing to use the drug in their fight with the entity, they hadn't ever really stopped taking it. And their continued use of Necro, combined with how much they've taken, is finally starting to take its toll. Their bodies are beginning to shut down. They beg Vlad to do something to help them, but he knows it's already too late. He helplessly watches as each of the heroes lets out an excruciating, agonizing scream and then falls to the ground, dead. Disappointed that their path came to such a horrible end, Vlad mourns the loss of the heroes and promises to honor their memory by rebuilding the country they ultimately gave their life for. However, there's another way the story can end. If, during the fight with the physical manifestation of Necro, the heroes are able to resist the urge of using the drug and defeat the entity without using it at all, then they will fully overcome their dependence on Necro and be rid of its influence. This time, when the vision fades, revealing the carnage of their battle, their bodies, without the large influx of Necro flowing through its systems, are able to keep it together, and the heroes survive. Vlad approaches, surprised to see the heroes alive, and delivers some good news. The security forces turned against the government and joined with the people, meaning they and the revolution had won. But the heroes, still coming down from their necro trip, can't really comprehend what he's saying. Recognizing they need medical attention, Vlad pulls them from the office to a nearby hospital where, over the course of the next few days, the heroes recover from their injuries. Some time passes, and two days before the heroes walked into the government headquarters, apparently, they meet Vlad in the town square to see that a statue in their honor has been constructed. Although initially impressed and awestruck with it, they soon become uncomfortable with having something put up that memorializes the violence they committed the day of the revolution. Mainly due to the fact that they weren't fighting for Vlad's cause, but for revenge for themselves. It was only by happenstance that they found themselves on the same side as the revolution. Vlad is able to put their worries to rest though by explaining that since they came out as the victors of the conflict, no one needs to know the truth of what they fought for, as history is written by the victors. What's important is that they are being seen as a champion for the people that led them on a crusade that finally freed them from their oppressors. And they can be an icon that the country's people can rally behind in these new times. Their nerves settled by Vlad's speech, the heroes accept the role that destiny has handed to them. And with the bright sun shining down on them, they, Vlad, and all the others begin the work 
of ushering in a new glorious period in Russia's history, bringing an end to the story of Mother Russia Bleeds. It's one of carnage, mystery, intrigue, and bravery, and actually touches on some very real human issues as well. The struggles of the lower classes, of substance abuse, war, and revolution. These are real things that humans have faced for generations and ones they will face in countless more. And it's these real human themes that makes the story of Mother Russia Bleeds, despite its obvious hyperbole, in a way, feel real and make it a great experience. And that about does it. I know this game is more straightforward than the others that I've covered, so I don't think there will be any questions, but if you have any, feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer them. But until next time, thank you for watching and see you later.